All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our session. Uh, this is um, our first time at this uh, Summer Learning Academy. So we are excited to be here. Um, there is, I'm sure some of you have already been to talks this morning. There are, uh, there's a chat box on the right hand side. Uh, I am monitoring the chat box. So if any questions pop up during, uh, while Karen and I are chatting, like please toss them in there. And there'll be a few places where we ask you some questions. So if you're comfortable enough to toss some answers in the chat box, uh, that would be really great and help help us engage with you a little bit more. Um, oh, I, heard, I should say who we are. I am Danielle Cox and we've got uh, Karen McClellan and we're from Mount St. Vincent University. And we're going to talk a little bit about using labs and reflective practices to kind of make mathematics inclusive um, or make it more inclusive you know, depending how your, your classroom is all set up. Um, so I see a few familiar names in the in the group. Uh, so uh, participants, so that's great. Uh, so for those of you who I already know and I've met before, hi, nice to virtually see you. Um, and for those of you who I have not met, uh, maybe someday we can meet in person at, a, at one of these conferences. Um, I will say that normally Karen and I, when we give presentations, uh, we really like to uh, mirror what it is we're talking about. So if we are in the same virtual, like same physical space, or if we had had the ability to use breakout groups, um, we would have had you actually doing a lab, doing reflective practices, and and actively doing what we're talking about. Um, uh, we are both kind of really big on kind of hands-on activities and, and the group work. So this presentation is going to be a little more luxury uh, than normally we would be giving if we're in person um, or a little more familiar with the technology. So we do apologize about that, uh, but hopefully you'll you'll get a little something out of our, our talk today. Uh, all right. So we are going to get started. Um, but first, I just want to make sure, uh, can people hear us and see the presentation OK? Hopefully someone can hear us at least. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> All right, Jessica. Thanks, Jessica. Excellent. <laughs> Perfect. Awesome. So this some of the folks were yeah, also asking, uh, we're chatting in the chat box. Great. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So let's get started. Uh, so Karen and I are from Mount St. Vincent, and I think uh, you guys being uh, kind of teachers in Nova Scotia probably are very familiar with the Mount. Um, so uh, Karen and I are in the Mathematics and Statistics Department there, and I do want to acknowledge that uh, the Mount is on um, is in Mi'kma'ki, so the ancestral and unceded territory of the of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, we uh, we do have an education program, so that's probably why most of you are familiar with the Mount. And Karen and I do some work with some of the uh, the faculty down in the education department, um, as well as in our home base of the math and stats department. And just a little bit about us. Uh, so we are not public school teachers. We do work at the university. Uh, we have taught at multiple universities across the Atlantic region. Uh, we have active research programs in the area of combinatorics. Uh, my field is graph theory and Karen's is number theory. And we have many projects that kind of overlap with one another. So we're, we have fun collaborating on research projects. And when we do, we always make sure that we involve our undergraduate students. So we see our research as also an extension of our teaching. Uh, and more recently, in the past few years, we've started to branch out into math education. Uh, and so we'll talk a little bit later about a project that we had started, which unfortunately we didn't get to complete due to COVID. And so we're gonna have to kind of restart it uh, once things get a little bit normal and we're all back in the classroom. Um, but we did collect some data and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, we are the past directors of the Nova Scotia Math Circles program at Dalhousie. And if you don't know what they do or who they are, please check them out. They uh, do free classroom visits and uh, they do a lot of really great things. Um, so we were there for many years during our grad studies and we ran the program. Uh, and then once we left Dal, we went off to our other universities to work. We also did outreach programs there. So we've done stuff at Dal and at State of X and Acadia, as well as our new home base of the Mount. 
Uh, we're also involved with the Women in Science and Engineering program. Uh, we've done outreach events for math and science for those folks, uh, as well as just visiting classrooms. Um, some of my closest friends teach in elementary, and I like to go in and visit their students. We did a few virtual visits this year, which is a little different, uh, but still a lot of fun. So although we are not uh, classroom public school teachers, uh, we have been in the classroom. Of course, it is different when you're a visitor coming in versus a you know, full time uh, in the class all day, every day, uh, public school teacher. So we will certainly value your input and any questions that you have while we're, while we're talking about what it is we're going to talk about, which are labs and uh, reflective practices. So the goal is just going to talk about how you can use mathematics labs and reflective practices uh, on our assessments to kind of give students an active voice in their math education and to really engage them in the mathematical process. So that's what we're really going to be highlighting uh, today. And to start with, uh, not to sound so negative, but I'm going to talk a little bit about what math is not, and then Karen will pick up with the uh, what we see math as being, the positive spin. Uh, and so I, I kind of laugh. This is meant to be kind of funny, kind of serious. Uh, so no, no math is not just writing formulas. Uh, I think some students see math as like, they see a question and they just automatically be like, I have to write a bunch of formulas on a page. Um, that's not what mathematics is. Uh, and I laugh because anytime you see a mathematician on television, Hollywood seems to think that we all write on clear glass walls and windows. Um, I have never done that. Karen, have you? No. I'd no, like I don't. <laughs> you would like to, um, but yeah, this is Hollywood's vision of the mathematician. We all, we all write on glass walls. Um, but the point is, like, mathematics is not just a bunch of formulas on a page. There's certainly more to it. And I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. The fact you're at a math talk tells us that you're interested in math, and you probably already know this. Um, you know, math is not ambiguous. When I see these sorts of equations or like things popping up on Facebook or my Instagram or Twitter or whatever it might be, uh, it really like bothers me. I hate these things that pop up sort of like the math equation that stumped the internet. Um, you know, this shouldn't be stumping the internet. Uh, this is, you know, math is not ambiguous. There is one answer to this problem. The answer is 16 and uh, you know, it's, I think it demonstrates how people and a lot of our students are uncomfortable with mathematics notation and how we write it. Uh, also, a mathematician or a math teacher, uh, yes, John, I also hate those so much. I have to like not comment because I know I'll probably get like, no, no, and get a little ranty and I don't want to get in any internet arguments with people. But I also hate those so much. Um, but this comes back to, right, their students and the general public are not comfortable with math. And they think these things feed into the, the, the idea that math is a mystery, that it's hard, that there's no rhyme or reason to why we do what we do. And so we're going to try to uh, suggest some ways that we can help our students realize there is rhyme and reason and structure to math. And we do things in a way uh, for a reason. And that's what the math labs will hopefully help us understand. Um, also, I would never write, if I wanted to do, you know, four times four, I'm not going to write it like this. I would write that as like, if I was going to write eight divided by two, I'd write that as a fraction. I wouldn't write that as eight, the division sign, two. Um, so, also, I mean, but yeah, it's a, I hate these as well. <laughs> but math is not ambiguous. Uh, math is not a gene you were born with. Uh, I assume that you folks teach math and You've probably heard it from your students. I know Karen and I have. Students will come to our office and just be like, oh, no, I can't do this. I'm, I'm not very good at math. I'm just never bored with it. Math is not, not something you're born with. It's not a gene. I, grade five, I spent most of my year in grade five math class sitting in the hall crying because I struggled. I didn't get it. I found it really hard. Um, you know, eventually overcame those uh, struggles to, clearly, but it's, uh, you know, math is not a gene. Um, so that's something that we also have to get our students to understand that it's a, it is a skill. Uh, Karen. All right. So yeah, we're never going to focus on a few things that math is. Uh, so we can think of math, of course, as a set of building blocks. Um, so even at the very foundations of math, right, we have axioms that we build upon, you know, Euclid's elements, for example, laid out the foundation of geometry. And then from there, we build up and build up to more complicated things. Right. So it's the same way in school. Of course, we start with the basics year after year. We teach kids new things and they add more tools to their toolkit. So we always think upon building upon what we already know. 
So the other thing we can say is that math. Oh, sorry, is... Karen. I, I forgot. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the clicker. Sorry, folks. The there clicker, we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, math is a skill that requires practice. And again, preaching to the choir, right? But I'm sure you all emphasize this to your students, particularly in math. I feel like it's one of those things that you don't get right away. And pretty much everyone, you, you don't get it right away at all levels of math, right? It takes some time and it takes practice. So um, it's something you have to do. It's not something you can watch someone else do. It takes patience, practice, and really working at it yourself. And we can also think about math as a precise language. So thinking of math as a language can be really beneficial, right? So we have symbols and notation and ways to put things together, just like we have grammar and spelling, you know, in a, in a language. So um, sometimes this can be what holds students back. Um, so sometimes, you know, students might understand the concepts, but they aren't, they aren't able to formulate it in the mathematical language. So if we think of it as a language, something we keep emphasizing, uh, reiterating what symbols mean, uh, that can be beneficial as well. And of course, math is all around us, as we all know, right? Some examples here, uh, the online security, all of this comes from number theory and cryptography. Lots of patterns and shapes in nature. You can see some spirals. I'm sure everyone's familiar with the golden spiral. Geometry, like the honeycomb. And, you know, any advanced electronics really at the, you know, foundation rely on mathematics. So, of course, we all know these things. But these are sort of the, the more positive spin, spins on it. So what we kind of want to focus on is thinking about math as a science. Um, so we all know how the scientific method works in other disciplines, right? We start with some observations, we ask questions, then we use that information to formulate a hypothesis. Then we might do some experiments, gather more data, analyze it, and come to a conclusion, or maybe not. Maybe we have to reformulate and go back to the beginning. So we want to kind of put math into this framework the same way we think about other sciences. So we've kind of broken it down into three steps here. Um, and we're going to expand on this a little bit. But the very basics, we can think of the first step as collecting data. So this is analogous to making observations, like scientific observations, asking questions about what if, just kind of sort of understanding what's happening. The next step, we think about making a conjecture, which of course is analogous to the scientific hypothesis. Right, so we might look for some formulas, look at our patterns, so we might look at some patterns and sort of put together a formula, for instance, that we think matches the data we've collected. So maybe our conjecture is some mathematical formula. And then in the last step, if possible, right, we want to try to prove, ideally, or maybe disprove our conjecture. So when we do science, right, we're doing an experiment, gathering data, analyzing the data, and we get more and more and more evidence to convince ourselves that our hypothesis is true. I guess it's a little different in math because we can take it one step further, right? So it's not just having significant evidence to convince ourselves, but we can actually prove that something is true, right? So in math, that's kind of the final step is the proving step. So you can see this little example on the side. You know, it's a simple example. We might have students pick a bunch of pairs of numbers and add them together and then look at some patterns, right? So they might see that if I add two even numbers, I get another even number. And you can do a lot of examples to convince yourself that that is true. If we want to formally prove it, we can, right, by using the definition of an even number that you can see sketched out here. So it's a little bit different, but we can still think of math within the framework of science and the scientific method. So again, just to review, uh, we collect data, we make a conjecture, and then we prove or maybe disprove the conjecture. So this is going to be sort of the framework for what we're going to define as the math lab in a little bit. So uh, if we think of math as a scientific process, it provides students with a structure to their mathematical learning process. So that's a big component of this, is that we're putting a structure on mathematical learning. So the why and the how might seem less mysterious, right? As Danielle said earlier, this stuff is not just coming out of thin air. We're putting a structure to it. It might seem less mysterious if mathematical discovery is given structure and if we're using proper language and notation as well. So we'll look at some examples uh, in a little bit of what we mean by math labs in a little more detail on that. Um, but for now, um, we can think as we move from, say, primary all the way up to post-secondary, 
uh, the expectations at these you know three steps are obviously going to change so someone maybe in upper elementary school might be able to collect data play with some examples maybe look for some patterns i.e you know make a conjecture but we would obviously not expect them to be able to you know mathematically prove anything at that level maybe they would be able to sort of explain why they think something is true then at higher levels, obviously, when you get into university math, we expect people to be able to prove these conjectures. So, of course, depending on the grade level and the difficulty level of the problem, these steps can vary a little bit. I can tell there is a lag still, so I'm just going to give it a second. Okay. Um, are there any questions so far before we kind of continue on? All good. All right. OK, uh, so um, continuing on. And again, if there are any questions, feel free just to type them in the chat box at any time. We're monitoring the chat box, even though there's a little bit of a lag. Um, so here's a question, if you have any input. Uh, when you think of a scientist, what type of attributes do you think that person requires? I'm waiting for the delay. <laughs> hmm. Good perseverance, creativity, definitely. Resilience, that's a good one. That's literally what I was typing. <laughs> I was like, oh, that is a really good one. As is creativity and perseverance. Ooh, risk taker. Inquiry. Awesome. These are all good answers. Yeah. Well, we're speaking to a bunch of scientists, I'm sure. Course, so they're right? thinking, what kind of skills do I have? <laughs> Analytic. Yes. Yeah, Julia, definitely. Problem solving. Yeah, that's, so, that's super important. That's a very good one, Michelle. Also, thanks to folks for like putting things in the chat mm. box. I'm sure you've taught online this year and you ask a question, you're like, maybe nobody will say anything. So. We appreciate to know there's people on the other side of the screen. <laughs> Suppose I'm more used to people not answering <laughs> than <laughs> classes online. <laughs> yeah, these are these are great. Um, if you think of something else, feel free to pop it in. There is this bit of a 10 second lag. So uh, if I, I might address, if you pop something in the chat box now, I'll address it maybe in 10 seconds. <laughs> All right. So I'm sure some of you are uh, familiar with with kind of Joe Bull, or we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but some of you kind of already commented in the chat box about some of the things that uh, I thought that the scientific uh, method required, uh, like curiosity, right? So that inquiry, uh, creativity. Uh, I think maybe it was John had tossed that in the chat box. Um, making connections, right? So that sort of is coming from Julia's like analytic skills, like you'd be able to think about what's happening, make those connections. Um, challenges, so the resilience. So I think it was uh, Jessica had mentioned resilience, right? You need to be resilient because when you're doing science, you're going to hit challenges. You're going to hit roadblocks. Um, uh, one that I didn't see pop up was uh, uh, collaboration. And that's a really big one. As a working mathematician, I think very rarely do I sit by myself and do work. I, uh, I'm constantly working with my peers. Uh, I have a research group. Usually it's Karen. <laughs> Karen and I working on problems together. Um, but these, these ideas, you know, you had those in the chat box and you're perfectly right. These are exactly uh, skills that scientists require. Um, and if you're familiar with Joe Bowler and her book, Mathematical Mindsets, you know, these C words are familiar. They're her five C's of mathematical engagement. 
But I mean, it's just not math, right? It's really scientific engagement. Um, and although the book, uh, a lot of it is kind of geared maybe towards uh, sort of maybe elementary type math, um, all of these these ideas are relevant for all levels of education. So I do I do recommend the book if you haven't haven't looked at it yet. But what we're going to do is kind of using the scientific method, what we can do is we can create mathematically rich learning tasks for our students um, that kind of are building on those those five C's up there. You know, the things you have in the chat box, the curiosity, the risk taking, the inquiry, the problem solving, the analytic skills, uh, the resilience, like that are going to highlight all of those skills and attributes, as well as showing that math is a process with structure and helping students to think logically. Um, so the scientific method is going to help us with that. So now we're going to get into what uh, Karen and I really want to chat about in detail, which is math labs and how we can use those in our classroom. Before we do, if you hear the word math lab, what comes to mind? Um, a colleague of mine who, who teaches at grade primary, I asked them, I said, what do you think when I hear the word math lab? And their response was, ugh. And they like, that was like a, I don't know what that response was, but it was just like a weird <laughs> noise. And I was like, okay, that's a valid response. Um, so if your response is a weird noise, feel free to like top, pop, pop that in the chat box. Um, but when you hear the words math labs, what sort of things do you envision or think about or what comes to mind? Discovery, structured in-class assignment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good, Michelle. Students problem solving together, Kaylin, yeah, that's great. Time to explore. Sarah, I really like that answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really important. It's time to explore. <laughs> Chaos. Uh, Jessica, I don't disagree. <laughs> Chaos <laughs> is something we have to welcome in our classrooms. Working together to solve math problems, guided inquiry. Yeah, Michelle, that's exactly sort of, uh, you hit the nail on the head there. Yeah, it's like a guided inquiry, prefer. Hands-on experiments, group work. Yep, trial and error. Yeah, awesome. You guys probably don't even need this presentation. It seems like <laughs> really well. Probably yeah, no, we're gonna have we'll, we'll have some good conversations. Yeah, yeah, these are all wonderful. Yep, I really like your your chaos there, uh, mm -hmm. there, Jessica, because it can certainly get a little chaotic. Um, a little chaos can be a good thing. But that's fantastic. Yep, awesome. So we kind of have a working definition uh, for math labs. And I'll wait till, uh... all right, sorry, it's just uh, a leg, so I was waiting for it. All right, so our working definition for a math lab is an activity designed using the scientific method uh, with the goal of allowing students to actively engage with mathematics material to make deep, meaningful connections. And really, you could take out the word mathematics and input biology, chemistry, physics, right? Because that's really just what a lab is. It's an activity using the scientific method to actively engage students in some science uh, to make deep, meaningful connections, right? So the hands-on experiments, the guided inquiry, the problem solving together, the time to explore, <laughs> which from that will come the chaos, <laughs> uh, data analysis, the structured in-class assignments, you know, everything that you were tossing in the chat box kind of falls under this definition. So you have exactly the image you have of a math lab in your mind is exactly what Karen and I had in our minds when we were doing labs in our classes and how we designed them. And a lot of you probably do activities in your classes already that if you haven't thought about structuring them as like a lab with sort of this uh, scientific method in mind of like data collection, um, you know, conjecture, testing your conjecture, uh, you know, then then uh, you can easily do this. It's a very kind of low risk activity that shouldn't take a whole lot of work to set up. Um, now, lab doesn't have to have big fancy manipulatives. You certainly can use them, but it's not necessary. Uh, so it can be something that's very easy to implement in your classrooms.
and I'll let Karen talk a little bit more about how we see lab structs being lab math labs being structured. Yeah, so we'll go into a little more detail uh, on those few steps and add a couple of others. Uh, so we're using the collect data, conjecture, prove or disprove as our framework, but we can sort of broaden this a little more. We know it's not always here's a conjecture, let's prove it, right? It, you know, oftentimes we're dealing with problem solving as well, so we can kind of incorporate that into this framework. Um, so same idea, right? You can, you know, if you have a problem, come up with some kind of solution and then be able to explain or show why it's true. So we can think of that under the same framework. So the first step, um, the collect data step, we like to think of this as the play step. Uh, so, you know, given a problem, students can, you know, obviously first start by thinking about what it means and then trying different examples is usually the place to start playing around with it. So trying different examples or maybe trying different techniques to solve a problem. Uh, and really at this stage, you're not really supposed to know what's going on, right? You're just playing around, trying to like gain some information on the problem. So once you start gathering some kind of information, it can be useful to organize using lists or tables, especially if you're doing like multiple examples, you know, looking for a formula maybe. Um, and this step usually requires a bit of background information or terminology. So depending on how you want to set it up, you can have students, you know, read through a few new ideas or definitions on their own, or you can start, you know, with the instructor or teacher presenting some information as a little introduction to the topic first, right? However you want to set it up. Um, the second step, make a conjecture. We like to call this the pattern step, right? So basically we want to look for patterns and for connections in the data that we collected in the first step or in the ideas that we've sort of gathered in the first step. So this is where we're going to put something together. It may be making a conjecture, coming up with a formula, solving a problem, coming up with a model or a method that works to solve a problem. This is where you're actually like putting everything together to come up with some kind of an idea. And it can be really useful in this stage to write your findings out in words, as well as, you know, writing things out mathematically. Uh, both are really beneficial. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we go. Using words within a math lab can be really important. Um, so the next stage, of course, uh, we can think about this one we didn't really put in the original framework, but we can think about testing the conjecture. So if you tried a few examples and you came up with some kind of formula, maybe you want to go back and try some more examples just to like give yourself, you know, some more evidence that it actually does work, right? So you want to test some more examples to check if this new model or solution that you just came up with does fit the data. So you could try some different types of examples. And maybe at this step, things fall apart, right? Maybe you realize, oh, that doesn't work. So you might want to think about why and go back and reformulate and start over. Okay, the same way you would after conducting a scientific experiment, if maybe something happens that you didn't expect to happen, you want to go back and reformulate and start over. Um, yeah, next slide. Thank you. And then next comes the prove step. And again, this doesn't always have to be like a formal mathematical proof. We can also think of this as the explain step. So you may just explain maybe in words why your solution or model or idea or formula, why it works. Uh, again, very beneficial to think of things in words as well as using you know mathematical language like we talked about before. And if it is appropriate for the question or the grade level, maybe at this point we would also write the explanation mathematically and maybe write, turn this into like a formal proof, right? Using mathematical language and notation. So we can also think about, you know, using multiple problems and building upon what we've already learned. So, right, we can have some extent, we can start with sort of one problem and then maybe we can extend it a little bit. We can modify or maybe increase the difficulty level of the problem Right, thinking back to that building blocks analogy, right, we can have students learn what they used in part one to maybe do a part two. Uh, and it's also a really good idea to encourage any what ifs from students. You know, lots of inquisitive students might say, well, what if we did it this way? Or what if we did it that way? Or what if we change this or that? Right, that often generates really interesting new problems and new ideas. And that should be encouraged to sort of follow up on some of those types of student questions, especially, if, you know, it shows that they're interested in what's going on. And just a couple of other points at the end, things we want to emphasize, again, writing clearly. If students have to write something, it might be a good idea for them to read each other's work, right? So students really quickly realize the importance of clarity when they have to read someone else's work or someone else has to read their work, right? So that's a good exercise. Um, 
And again, emphasize, like I said before, proper mathematical language and notation. You want to, you know, define any variables that you use, for example, so everything is clear. And again, maybe one of the biggest things to keep in mind is you don't need to get it right the first time around. Math almost always requires a lot of trial and error at all levels, and maybe even more so at higher levels, right? So it's it's never like, I know what to do, here's the answer, there's, especially with some more complex types of um, setups like these labs, there's a lot of trial and error involved. So I think now we're going to, to look at a couple of examples of potential math labs. I can't hear you anymore, Danielle. I don't know if that's on my end or your end. That was me. I muted myself while you okay. were speaking. <clears throat> Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, so here's an example um, of a lab. So I pulled this activity from the math uh, grade seven. Um, it's an implementation draft from June 2015. This was what I could find on the the department's website. Um, I did find some some more recent ones, but they seem to be kind of pared down <clears throat> to address kind of the time lost during COVID. Uh, but I'm, I mean, this is still a topic that's that's covered in grade seven, I'm sure, the idea of equ writing equations and solving them. So here's an example that was from that, that uh, document. And it says, just consider the following sample tasks that can be adapted uh, either for like formative or uh, some of the assessment. And it says to create and solve an equation for the following context. I have 14 collector pins from events I have attended at the stadium. Together, my friend and I have 19 pins. How many pins does my friend have? And then there's another similar type problem about students and their way they're transporting themselves to and from school. And then there's a, another little question after that. that's just identify which equations have the solution of x equals negative 2. So I took this and I thought, OK, well, how could I take this activity and turn this into what I would see as being a structured mathematics lab, kind of using that scientific process and the steps that Karen and I have been talking about. Oh, sorry, I got two screens going, so I sometimes have to remember where my cursor is. There we go. <laughs> so the word problems, really nice. We love when students have to think about word problems, right? It really gets them engaged in the mathematics and gives it somewhat of a real world spin, depending on the word problem. And the second bullet there with the solving the equations I means students have to do drill work in order to master a skill. Um, you know, we've all heard the analogy. It's like math is like a sport or any other playing an instrument. You just you got to practice um, in order to improve and, and obtain mastery. Uh, so, I mean, we could just put this on a handout and have the students in little groups and do the whole think, pair, share activity. You know, work on this as a group, chat with your neighbor if you get stuck, or, you know, work on it individually and then pair them up and do the think, pair, share. So there's certainly ways that you can have them work on this, not as a solitary uh, activity, um, but how can we re redesign this to be like that mathematics lab? What could that look like? And so I think, Karen, you had posted these the PDFs of our examples in the, the shared folder. Yes, if I did it properly, they should be there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but here, I'll pull up the PDF of, so hopefully we can see that. So this is how I would have made, uh, kind of modeling this after the labs I was using in my calculus classes. Um, yeah, my lab, I've got some sort of title for it, the student's name, their group members, just reminding them, work as a group, but you're all gonna submit your own work, right? I wanna be able to read what they've written so I can offer them individualized feedback. Uh, so kind of using the idea of like collect data, conjecture, test it, uh, prove it, extensions and emphasizing uh, writing and whatnot. Here's how I would have modeled sort of this activity as a lab. I may have would have asked for the first question do, to do something a little more um, data collecty, right? Write down all the different ways that you can write the number 19 as a sum of two positive numbers. For example, one plus 18, um, right? That's sort of like data collection. Uh, it's also nice because this is a task that everybody in the group, regardless of their level of mathematics, because of course you have some students in your class that are really struggling, you have others that are really advanced, um, but everybody should have success with this type of problem. Um, the second one kind of let's use this data. So 
asking some questions, you know, just looking at what you wrote above, that data you collected, how could we solve these questions? You know, Amir has two collector pins, their friend has some as well, so that the total number of pins is 19. How many pins does Amir's friend have? Right? So they could not necessarily have to write out the equation, but they can look at their data and be like, oh, look, 2 plus 17 is 19. Amir's friend must have the 17 pins. Um, and again, this is something that a lot of the students, if they're struggling, they should still be able to achieve some success with this because they've already collected some data. And it's just kind of looking back. Um, and for, of course, there's not really like a proved conjecture type uh, activity for this, um, but we can still continue on with that, that scientific method. Uh, and so question three here is, in my mind, I think one of the most important questions, I ask a lot of questions like this in my upper level math classes at the university and in my introductory calculus and statistics classes. Um, so the question I have here is, if Amir and their friend have a total of 19 pins, uh, we know how many pins Amir has. Can we find out how many pins their friend has? You know, explain your thoughts in words. Um, and I really like this and I ask questions like this in my classes all the time. Students at first don't like them and then they learn that they actually really like this type of question for multiple reasons. Uh, one, it helps that, like, it's hard to teach someone to think logically, right? That's what we really want to try to do in math. And that's sort of the idea of why we want to kind of make these math labs and structures. Oh, Michelle, yes, yeah, sorry. You could definitely get a copy of the presentation. Yeah, we're going to provide our emails at the end and we will um, happily send up. The PDF's really big. That's why we didn't upload it, but I'll compress it and I'll email it out to whoever would like a copy. Sorry, I didn't see your chat there. So, these types of questions where we're asking to explain their thoughts in words, it's hard to teach someone to think logically. And that's really what you need to be successful in math is to have a logical thought process. So these labs as a scientific method and kind of structuring is helping to try to get them to think logically. But question three here is helping the students gather their thoughts and explain what they're thinking using their words, right? There's no wrong answer really that the students, so if the students think, no, I know I cannot figure out how many pins Amir's friend has, that's okay. They should be able to write that. That's, and I would not mark that incorrect. I would, but that would show to me that the students are struggling with this concept, right? It's not the math notation they're struggling with. It's the actual concept. So, so now I can address that. So they're, they're, Passively having an active voice uh, in their math learning, whether they realize it or not. And the step of having to write out in words sort of what they're thinking, um, you know, it might also help the students understand if they're struggling, where their struggle is. I know I think about, of course, at a higher level, if I'm doing a research project, I hit a roadblock. I sometimes don't know why or where I'm stuck. Like, so I will sometimes write out in words, like, here's what I know, here's what I'm trying to find out. And then through that process, I can articulate to myself, oh, oh, this is where I'm stuck. This is what I don't understand. Whereas I kind of didn't think about that before until I started kind of writing down like a little journal, how I was, how I was feeling about this project. Uh, so at the explaining your thoughts and words, I think is really, really important. And I think we should encourage more students to do that, just like they do in like biology and chemistry labs, you know, they write out sentences as well as like chemical equations and whatnot. Um, but words are good. We can use our words. Students shouldn't think they have to write equations and equations. And it helps us understand where they're struggling, whether the students know where they're struggling or not. We can then see are they struggling at a conceptual level or is it the math notation and the actual math language that they're struggling with? They know they need to use X and Y's, but they don't know how, but they understand conceptually what needs to be done. And then that helps us really tailor uh, the education that they're getting in their math class. If they're, they're stuck, we know where to go and help them. And maybe it's a collective, maybe a lot of the students in the class are having the same problem. And then we can you know, address that as a whole. Because maybe it was something uh, I missed when I was teaching calculus, I, something I didn't hit on very well. And I see the mass, on mass, everyone's struggling with this particular topic and they're all struggling in the same way that I can think back and reflect on what I did. Like, oh, you know what? I didn't do this so great. Let's let's reassess and talk about this again and try to get everybody back on point. Um, so yeah, those are my favorite questions, the using your words. Uh, and then of course, uh, going to sort of the, the next level, we can try to get them to like write out an equation. 
not necessarily even solve it, just see if you can write an equation use any defined variables that you use. So now we've taken it sort of to uh, to the level that we want. We want them to write out a math equation. We're getting them there, helping them think through that process. And maybe this is where some students are gonna start to struggle. Uh, but this is where maybe some of the stronger students can then step in and help students who are struggling. And then of course, the let's do that extension. Let's make up your own problem kind of like this and write out a solution. And now let's give it to a friend in your group and see if your group can solve your problem. And then, uh, again, that's another great way to emphasize the mathematical communication, the writing, the clarity, uh, as well as just the mathematical thought process itself. And I think, Karen, you have another example that you would like uh, to yeah. share. Sure. So the second example uh, is a little more complex, and it's definitely for a higher level. Sorry. There you go. Yeah. So, um, so you can see here that... Um, this may, may not be um, content that's directly covered in the curriculum, but definitely would hit the outcome of logical reasoning, which is in the was it grade 12 curriculum. Yeah. So if you want to pull up the um, PDF, we can have a closer look. So this math lab is going to be about triangular numbers and sums. So it's a really interesting topic, and it's something that you can play around a lot with. So I'll go through this a little quickly because it's kind of long, but um, the PDF should be available if you want to take a closer look at it. So we start with, again, something pretty straightforward that everyone can do. Okay, look at the following sequence of triangles and count the number of dots in each. So the idea is we want to get a numerical sequence. Okay, everyone can do that. Um, then kind of look at how the triangles are drawn. See if you can draw the next two and then count the number of dots in each. So we want to extend the pattern a little bit. So this is kind of the play step, kind of you know understanding what, what we're working with. Uh, and then part C says, without drawing anything, what are the next two numbers in the sequence? So we know that these triangles kind of match up with numbers, right? the number of dots. But without drawing the triangles anymore, can you look at the sequence of numbers and see what this pattern should be? Now, of course, if we were you know, doing this a little differently, we would maybe take some more time and actually you know, have you guys work through some of this. But um, we don't, we're just going to move through. So having them sort of look at the sequence of numbers, generate the next two. Um, question two, we're going to go a little deeper. So part A says, like Danielle was just talking about, explain in words how you were able to deduce your answer in 1C. So you noticed a pattern in the triangles and the number of dots in the triangles. And what was it? How did you find the next two? Um, so we're going to switch gears a little and say, OK, now for each triangle, write the total number of dots as a sum of the number of dots in each row. So you could see that, for example, the triangle that had four rows, there was one on the top, then two, then three, then four, and that sums to 10. Right? So you can see the sequence 1, 3, 6, 10, 15, and you can probably gather that the next triangle, right, is going to be the same, but we're going to put a row of five. So it seems like every time each one of these triangles is the sum of one plus two plus three plus four plus five, up to however many rows there are. So we want them to sort of grasp that idea. Uh, and then we can sort of expand, right? So if you had a triangle with 10 rows, how many dots would it contain? So they could do that out by brute force, right? Drawing the triangle if they want to, or using this one plus two plus three all the way up to 10 to find that number. But what if we wanna go further? So we wanna keep pushing this. So what about a triangle with 100 rows? Well, of course, they're not quickly gonna be able to add up all the numbers one through 100. So we need to start thinking about okay, how can we do this for large numbers? So we want them to think about uh, maybe expressing it at first as a sum, so that they do understand that we're going to have one plus two plus three plus dot 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 all the way up to we're going to add all the way up to 100. And then even in general, we can start generalizing, we can start abstracting this a little bit. If the triangle had n rows, right, how could we write this as a sum, the sum of numbers one through n. So we're getting into this idea of taking sums of consecutive numbers now. So part three, uh, we kind of pulled this all together. Uh, the famous mathematician Gauss came up with a formula for this, which I'm sure you're familiar with. But um, an interesting anecdote was that as a schoolboy, he was obviously very bright. His teacher wanted you know, to have a little quiet time, asked the class to add the numbers one through 100. And Gauss was very able quickly to very quickly able to come back with the number 5050. 
So the next few questions are kind of going through his method that he came up with as a child, <laughs> which is very impressive. So he came up with the formula 100 times 101 over 2. Now, obviously, this is not something like I would come up with or we would expect our students to come up with, but we give them a little bit of a framework for Gauss's thought process, right? So you can see this table here. Uh, there are columns, 100 columns, essentially, in two rows. And if they examine this a little bit and think about how can we go from this table to this formula, you can probably pretty quickly see how this is working and how we can use this formula to add up the numbers from 1 to 100, right? So we have 100 columns. Each column adds to 101. But because we have two rows, we've double counted, so we divide by two. So we explore this a little bit more and abstract to the most general case and say, well, could you write this formula for the sum of n numbers, right? So here's like sort of conjecturing a formula. Test it out a little more by once you have, you know, a concrete formula, plug in some other values of n. So here we're sort of convincing ourselves that the formula is true by gathering a little more evidence. And then the last step, of course, can you use Gauss's table to sort of explain, you know, i.e. prove um, how your formula works? So we kind of gave them the framework for like a concrete number 100 and then asked them if they can abstract that to some general number n. Um, that's sort of the proof step. And then how is this formula related to the triangular numbers? Not to forget where that came from. We tie it back in, well, these sums actually are the triangular numbers, the sum of consecutive numbers from 1 through n. So we went through you know, finding, uh, playing around, finding some patterns to proving, explaining, and generalizing into a formula. And lastly, really quickly, uh, we can extend this to other shapes. So if you wanted to take this further, Right, there are square numbers. We can use the dot idea to make pentagonal numbers, hexagonal numbers, by drawing these uh, shapes and counting the number of dots to give sequences. So there are lots of way, you know, directions we could take this even further. So that's just an example of a more advanced lab and how we can sort of build up these steps. Oh yeah, and there's one other little exercise that I'll mention. I really like this one. It's uh, sort of a little game called Always, Sometimes, or Never. And I only just heard of this uh, fairly recently in another teaching talk I attended, but there is, uh, it's from this website here of teacher resources that you can visit if you like. And basically there's a list of statements and you have students classify them as always true, sometimes true, or never true. Uh, and we can do this you know, with cutout cards or however you want to make it a little more interactive. And I really like this idea because it's not just if something is true or false. Uh, you really have to think a little bit more deeply about it to think not just if it's false, but is it always false or is it sometimes true and sometimes false? So I like that sort of added element. So, for example, um, you know, multiples of five end in five, right? So I know there's a lag, but if you want to type in, you know, whether that's always true, sometimes true or never true, uh, you can. And then, you know, you can see some of these others. We don't have a whole lot of time to go through them. Um, but, you know, simple little uh, statements that they typically can work through just by doing a number of examples to kind of convince themselves. So where it says, can you explain your choices, right? That's kind of the proof step. Oh, good, sometimes true, right? So we know, okay, sometimes they end in five, sometimes they end in zero, right? So similar um, statements here. So we can ask them to explain their choices which in the case of sometimes, right, might mean giving an example where it's true and an example where it's false, but the always or never may require a little more explanation to show why it's always the case that this happens. Or you can even sort of say, can you change um, the never or sometimes statements so that, so that they are always true? So maybe you want to say, well, multiples of five end in five or zero. You know, we turned it into an always statement. So there's a lot of fun little things you can do with this. I'm actually going to try it out in my... Um, proof class that I'm teaching in September kind of as an icebreaker just to get people <laughs> thinking mathematically. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, you can have a look at that website. I know we don't have a whole lot of time left. Um, so we were going to ask you guys what you feel are some of the pros and cons of incorporating labs into your classrooms. Uh, and again, because of the lag, maybe if you guys have some ideas, you can stick them in the chat box. We are going to go through some of these things here. Um, 
and maybe we can keep going. And like I said, you can type any ideas you have in the chat box and we'll monitor that. So really quickly, this study from the literature, this was an Italian study from 2014, where math labs were introduced into classrooms for 2,600 students between six and 18 years old. Um, let me change the slide. So basically the main goal was to test the effectiveness of teaching math using lab kits. Uh, change it again, I guess. I'll go through this a little quickly. And the lab kits were pre-designed and handed out to the teachers, which consisted of uh, materials, sometimes manipulatives with question sheets to work on. Now, I like their definition of the math lab. Um, they say it's not intended as a physical place opposed to a classroom, but rather as a set of various and structured activities that aim at constructing meanings of mathematical objects. So I think that hit on the two key ideas that it's a structured activity and students are constructing meaning. So I like that definition. So just really quickly, I'll state, okay, here are some of the maybe pros, right? So everyone was had pretty positive feedback, less so with students aged 11 through 13, this may not be surprising, um, but teachers and students all enjoyed the activities. Stu uh, teacher said, students are not just listening listening but they're constructing their own knowledge um they, they they did highlight that some of the labs were difficult but they did them anyway because they don't want students to think mathematics is always quick and easy right there are some difficult problems um there's maybe a little bit lost in translation because this came from an italian paper but um one of the student comments we can see here is we did not need to suffer in learning mathematics. That might have been my favorite, right? So I guess reducing student suffering is a good goal to have, <laughs> I think. Um, people say it's not easy. We had to think a lot, but it's beautiful. And I was not frightened of making mistakes. That was one of the really key um, comments that we noticed. So students were sort of a little more open to doing this group work and trial and error, making mistakes. Uh, a couple more notes on this you can switch the slide. So there were a lot of positive outcomes. You know, students had to work together discussing where to even start with these problems. Right. And realizing that kind of everybody is in the same boat. Right. So often people think they're bad at math because they sit down and they don't know what to do. But doing these kind of structured activities. Right. It, they all realize it takes everyone a little bit of time to sort of understand what's going on and what they're supposed to do. So some of these things we already talked about, right? Discussing with peers, communicating a concept requires a deeper level of understanding than simply understanding a concept. It gave students a different way of looking at the material um, and students saw the positive role of making errors. And again, as Danielle pointed out, kind of a byproduct of this was that um, these kind of labs are really good for multiple levels of students, like students who are really struggling versus students who are you know, achieving really high grades, for example, because there's sort of questions for everyone and everyone gets to sort of work together and share their ideas. Um, I'm going to move ahead. So you want to talk a little about the differences between labs and group work? Perhaps? Yeah, and I think just for the sake of time, um, I'm not probably going to open this up to the chat box, but uh, because I think we're probably at this point pretty familiar yeah. with the idea because we had some comments earlier that people were like, oh, labs, I see them incorporating group work. And they definitely do, right? And from group work, we get the important things like uh, you're working as a group to get an answer. There's collaboration. Um, you are verbally communicating math in a way that you're not going to get if you're working by yourself or listening to a teacher or a professor lecture on. Uh, but the labs and the structure of them, right? So the really important is the structure. Can I taste it? group work to the next level, right? Uh, the purpose of the lab is to show that math is a process like other sciences, making math seem a little bit less mysterious. You know, there's a structure to the problem solving process. We're trying to help guide that structure and help them to think logically and be able to apply that. Uh, you know, I think like Julia said, kind of a simulating knowledge. You're gonna be able to take this and use it in future assessments and, and activities that you see. Uh, it is students realize the importance of writing math and using proper notation and clarity. Uh, but I also see labs just like in biology or chemistry or physics as you, you're, the emphasis is you're communicating your results, right? So I think students have to maybe be told <laughs> this explicitly, but like 
I know how to do the math problem. You're not just showing me the answer. I know how to get there. You're showing me you understand what's going on and that you know how to get there. Um, so the emphasis is on the communication of their results. Uh, and that's why it's I really try to emphasize, it is okay to use your words. You don't have to have a page of equations. Explaining your thought process in words. First, I decided I was gonna do this and I obtained this equation, they write the equation. After that, I had to plug in X equals seven because I had seven candies or whatever it is, right? And then they do that, they plug in the seven and they continue on. They just have to be equation, equation, equation. Explaining their thought process, writing sentences in between, I highly encourage and it helps the students understand why they're doing what they're doing and helps them us see if they know why they're doing what they're doing. They're not just copying the, an example from a textbook or from an example we did in class. And also us have to, we have to mimic that when we're doing examples in class, I write out words in between what I write, right? So it's like a little mathematical essay with equations. Um, I mimic what I want my students to see. And I, I kind of use this as uh, the example of my, my niece, very, very fond of whales. If I asked her to write an essay about everything she knew about whales, she's four years old. She knows her alphabet, but she can't print. Um, so she's not going to be writing me an essay about whales, but she would go all about, well, Dee Dee, blue whales are the biggest whales. And they're not just big, they're massive. And whales, their tails go like this. And sharks, their tails go like this. Like she has a very high level understanding of mammals versus like fish for a four-year-old. Um, but if I asked her to write that in words, she's not going to be able to, but she can verbalize it and I can get that she understands. It's the same thing if allowing students to and encouraging them to write words in their math, like, like we're writing at actual science lab, can communicate to us that they understand what's happening, even if they're struggling with maybe the way to actually how to write out the mathematical equations that we kind of want them to learn. And I do realize we're rushing because we only have a few minutes mm -hmm. left. So we do want to have some time for, for questions. But I will just say that in calculus this year, uh, this past year, I did have labs. Um, and I always had structured group work in my classes, but I wasn't structuring it in terms of like a scientific process, um, sort of thinking about collecting data, analyzing it, conjectures, kind of uh, uh, emphasizing the writing aspect. So I did change the way I did my, it wasn't just group work. I did turn it into a scientific lab um, and the students loved it. And it was online, so it was even, but we had like breakout groups and I had my TA going around. So it was sort of, a, it was a little different. Um, I can only imagine it would be more successful when I do it in person in the fall. Uh, but I did have a student who was retaking the course to get a higher grade and they had taken the class when I just had my regular group work versus the structured mathematical lab with a scientific kind of mindset when I wrote the labs. And they just, they had saying its praises. They said it really helped them think kind of about the math, why they're doing what they're doing, where they're getting stuck, help them articulate uh, where their struggles <laughs> were. And they did a lot better. Uh, and I, they, they said it was the labs that helped them get there. So I know it's only one student's comments, um, but it, you know, that one student made the difference for. And so for me, it was worth the effort to, to put that together for them. So I'm sure the other students also found benefit from them. Uh, and again, this is sort of just stuff that we've already talked about. So I'm not gonna go over this slide. But um, kind of, I think in the interest of time, we'll kind of maybe stop at this point. I will just say we did also add to our labs um, reflective questions at the end, sort of what did you understand the best? Where did you struggle? What's something new that you learned, right? And these are things that you would have seen if you've read Joe Bowler's book, right? This is not a new idea. A lot of people do reflective practices. I will say that I we, um, had these on all of our assessments and we pulled our students we had a survey that they did at the end of term they only got half the data because COVID happened and things went weird uh, but most of the students did not think that the reflective practices were super helpful you can kind of look through the the presentation I'll happily email it out if you want to take a look at this but what I did find their comments were like it allowed me to look back and it was easy points it made me stop and think about what I was doing and where I struggled uh, you know, and these are things that we shouldn't have to ask questions to force them to do. We want them to see, do that naturally. Uh, so I do apologize. The reflective practice was pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty quickly done there, um, given we only have a minute left. But if uh, there are anyone wants the presentation, send us an email. And uh, if you have any questions about anything, including the very quick reflective <laughs> practices we kind of flew through, we're very yeah. happy to have another conversation or share some stuff with you through email if you like. Um, and thanks for attending. We appreciate yeah, the, the audience. I hope everyone has a lovely summer.
Yeah, no, Michelle, that's a that's a great comment. Uh, it really does depend on the student engagement. Uh, so I will say I did have some students, and again, I deal with older students, right? I'm not teaching elementary. Uh, you know, I'm kind of teaching high school or sorry, university. So that most of them are fresh out of high school, like they're first year students. And there's some students who just don't want to be engaged. And also at the university, if they don't want to be there, sometimes they just don't show up, but they'll show up, they'll kind of sit in the back of the class. Um, and if somebody wants to work by themselves and be disengaged, like I try my best to engage them, but if they choose not to, then that's, I mean, you can only do so much. But I understand that in a, in a public school setting, that's a little more difficult when you have 30 students in mm -hmm. your class. Yeah, thanks folks, take care. Thank you.